Welcome back to another episode of The Founder, a show that features entrepreneurs and their early stories of ingenuity, struggle, and perseverance to get their companies off the ground. We do our best to capture the uncensored, uncovered look behind the curtain into what founders really face when getting started. I'm your host, Callaway. Our founder guest on today's episode grew up in Florida with the sounds of Jimmy Buffett music ringing through the yard from as early as he can remember. After studying economics and international relations in college, he ended up working as a customer experience consultant at IBM, traveling across the Northeast to serve his clients. One day, after wearing his dad's vintage Hawaiian shirt for the millionth weekend in a row, he wondered why no one had modernized it for the current day consumer. He realized that as social media began to grow in popularity and people were taking more and more pictures on the weekends, guys couldn't get away with having the same old shirt in every photo. When he saw that tropical and floral prints started to regain popularity, he knew that his calling was to reimagine island wear for the modern consumer. That's when he went all in to start Kenny Flowers. Today at Kenny Flowers, this founder and his team are on a mission to help you embrace that feeling of vacation each and every day. What started out as a floral printed short sleeve button down shirt has quickly turned into a full line of his and hers modern resort wear. Their product line ranges from Hawaiian shirts and swim trunks for guys to women's swimsuits and cover-ups, and even matching couple sets. And the devil is in the details when it comes to their design. Each of their flagship shirts are made in Bali with stitched lay-down collars, coconut buttons, and a sunglass loop in the front pocket to keep your shades protected at all times. Kenny Flowers has been at it for the last six years and sees nothing but smooth sailing and high growth ahead. And as a special offer for our listeners, I teamed up with this founder to get you 15% off all of their products. That's shirts, bathing suits, and even matching couple sets. Just use code FOUNDER15 at checkout to take advantage. This is an inspiring interview that shines a spotlight on partnering with local suppliers to build a thriving e-commerce business. I hope you enjoyed as much as I did. Now introducing the founder of Kenny Flowers, Kenny Hastfield. Let's get it. Kenny, welcome to the show. Thanks so much for coming on. It's great to be here, Callaway. Thanks for having me. Yeah, of course. We're looking forward to it today. So, you know, what I like to do to start out the show, before we dive into the origin story and, and the different parts of the business, could you just start with a, a snapshot and kind of give the audience, for those who may not have heard of Kenny Flowers before, what the company looks like today? You know, what's the mission, vision of the company? What are the products you sell and, and how big are you today? Absolutely. Um, yeah. So, I mean, Kenny Flowers is Let's see, we've been in business five, six years now. Doesn't feel like it. Um, you know, it still feels like the humble beginnings. And we've been growing at a, a pretty quick pace year over year. So right now we are, um, you know, a fully remote company. We have a um, couple employees, few contractors. And essentially what we do is we're, we're all about embracing that feeling of vacation every day. So for us, it's, it's not necessarily about where you are, but just like how you're feeling. And hoping that, you know, what we can do for our customers through our products is, you know, bring a little joy to their day, help them set the tone for the type of day that, um, that they want to have. We always say that when you put a Kenny Flower shirt on, you're basically making the decision to have a better day. Um, so, I mean, we've, you know, it started out with just a Hawaiian shirt that, you know, I used to always wear. It was a hand-me-down from my dad. Loved wearing that thing, wore it way too much. And it inspired me to go out and try to make a more modern version of that, um, something that was a little bit more uh, stylish, not as baggy, and you know, fun, unique patterns that you couldn't really find at any of the big box retailers. Um, so that's how we started. And since then, it's been a wild journey. We've morphed into so much more than just shirts. We're currently um, what I'd consider like a modern resort wear brand. My fiance has helped really build out the women's side of the business. Um, so not only do we offer Hawaiian shirts, um, swim trunks for men, but we also have women's swimwear, beach cover-ups, et cetera. So everyone can be a part of the party. Yeah. The full kind of tropical lifestyle brand. Yes, exactly. And I'd love to take a step back, rewind the clock and just hear about your background. You know, as fast or as slow as you'd like, take us through your life and, and kind of journey to get here. I think 
the story that I saw online and I've seen a couple of videos, right? You quit your job, moved to Bali, and that's how this got started. And I think a lot of people like evangelize that life. So it'd be great to hear how it went down. Yeah, I mean, it started out as a dream and then I did what I could to make that a reality. Um, but to take a few steps back, I mean, I was I was born in Florida with Jimmy Buffett music, you know, playing in the backyard and um, moved to Colorado, got into ice hockey, all the opposite of tropical island types of activities and um, went, went to college, majored in economics, international relations, which ironically, I think I did learn a lot from and use today in my uh, in my role with Kenny Flowers. And then um, after that, I was a consultant at IBM. So I was, you know, working a professional consulting job in Boston, New York area, often living out of a suitcase, working with clients across, um, you know, banking, tech, retail industries, and doing what I could as a um, customer experience consultant to help them better understand their customers and really just create experiences that um, kept them loyal to the brand, which, you know, I actually really loved that work. I just knew there was a way to apply it to something I was a little bit more passionate about than, uh, than banking necessarily. So for me, it was living a fun post-grad life, a few years in the Northeast, and out of nowhere, this idea came about. And the second, you know, I'm happy to dive in more to that story, but um, the second the idea came about, I knew it was my calling. And all of a sudden, all the, the comforts of a, you know, professional consulting job and being in a city with a bunch of my friends um, quickly went out of the window. I knew this was a chance I had to take. Yeah, I'd love to double click on that. I think a lot of people, and I'm sure you have a bunch of friends, I have a bunch of friends that like always think of these ideas. And and to be fair, like they don't know what first couple steps to take. And that, that first three to six months is critical to try to get something off the ground. So take us through that journey and, and kind of the twists and turns that it took. Absolutely. So once I realized that Kenny Flowers was really my, my calling and that if there was a guy to go out in the world and figure out how to make a better Hawaiian shirt, that was me when I knew that. I knew I could go confidently into it. And it was a huge risk at the time, you know, Hawaiian shirts were slowly starting to creep onto the scene, but there weren't really, it wasn't really back that way. But what I noticed in this overall market and my personal needs as a consumer was that all of a sudden everyone was on Snapchat, on Instagram. And suddenly as a guy, you couldn't really get away with wearing the same shirt every weekend like you used to. Um, all of a sudden, your you know your Instagram feed would just be three photos in a row over the span of a month wearing the same shirt, and like that just I, I was realizing that didn't fly. And I would always wear that go-to Hawaiian for my dad, whether I was in the city, out in the Hamptons, on a boat, whatever the occasion was. That was what I felt best in. So when I got started, I knew you know the idea came about, and it seemed crazy. It was kind of like okay, I could I could potentially do this. It became my calling. And then what I started to do to like get myself fully in the mentality of this is my next step is when I was asked that simple question, um, you know, oh, what do you do for work? I started saying, I'm actually about to quit my job and go move to Bali to make some better, more modern, like island woven shirts. And that was the mentality shift that that I needed. I, you know, the feedback was very positive. Sometimes it was just a laugh, like you're crazy. Um, other times it was, you know, sign me up for whenever you launch these things. And it gave me the the courage and confidence that I needed to really just move halfway around the world with no background in fashion design, um, production, international business, et cetera. Um, those first three to six months, what I did, like you said, I mean, I, I, moved, I moved over there. I didn't want to be emailing a factory in China and waiting on samples for three months while paying New York rent. Like I knew I needed to get on the ground and figure this thing out for myself. Um, I'm way more a hands-on learner. So for me, it was, it was never a choice of like, would I start as a side hustle? Would I do this full time? I literally booked a one-way ticket over there and got on the ground, went to hundreds of, you know, fabric shops, scouring through all sorts of uh, old textiles and some of the like initial prints for our shirts you know, found factories on the ground, just started my Shopify store from a remote location and found out that I could pretty much operate an online business from wherever I was in the world. I don't think I could have done it if I was in the city with distractions. Like I had to just go into my own, you know, focus zone, hunker down for a few months of that um, January to 
call it May 2015 time to make the first few hundred shirts for my friends. I had saved up money. I wasn't raising money um, from any outside sources. I was just pouring what I had saved into those initial few months in Bali and creating the best possible shirts I could for friends, family, and whoever might hear about uh, Kenny Flowers at the time. Totally. Yeah, it's crazy. You, you didn't have a background in, in apparel or fashion at all. And, and the brand has scaled so, so far since then. It's amazing. Yeah. So that's, well, I was actually going to just throw in some of the initial advice that I was given from, you know, friends more in private equity, um, even founders of other companies was, hey, like, you know, put together a business plan. Um, you should probably find yourself a fashion designer to partner with on all of this since you have no background in it. And, you know, all of a sudden it was a New York minute and I was on the way to Bali without either of those things. So <laughs> I was sort of forced to focus on the ground and figure it out that way, which I think in the end worked out best. Yeah. I feel like the, and we've had a couple of founders on say this, like the business plan idea is, is really old school and outdated. I feel like you, you spend all this time on a business plan. By the time you're done, the numbers and the assumptions have already changed, like have already updated new things have happened. Absolutely. Yeah. I can completely relate to that. I mean, I don't, think focusing on a business plan is the best first play. Um, I do think there is a place for business plans down the road. Like even now, I like to have a little bit of an idea of, okay, what am I doing? What does it look like in a year and three years, five years? Because um, otherwise you, you can't end up spinning in cycles. Totally. I feel like it's it's never been easier to start a D2C company, of course, because of Shopify and, and especially in apparel, it feels like they're popping up like all the time. And so I imagine differentiation and building like sustained customer loyalty. Those are some of the critical things that you focus on all the time because, because that's the only way to stand out across all the Instagram ads that you see on the feed. Right, so how do you, right. how do you think about it for the Kenny flowers brand, right? What are those like core tenants that you've anchored to that have worked so far? Yeah. I mean, the first couple of years I was just, I was so focused on creating the best product I could and letting the brand resonate, how it would resonate with my first customers and on. I think when you're when you're creating a brand, it's really important to actually know and understand what your customers care about. And in the beginning, I I wasn't going off an e-commerce playbook. Right now, if you look how to look up how to start an e-commerce company, you can find you know ten helpful tips that'll keep you busy for a couple months. Back then, you know, I I, I knew Shopify was the right call, um, the base of the operation. And but, but past there, I really wasn't into paid advertising at the time. Now that I have grown the business for a few years and gotten into um, all the digital marketing, you know, strategies and and things in place. I've definitely learned a few things. And it, it, if if you want, I'm happy to just kind of talk through some of the the basics. Yeah, that'd be great. I guess to start, the core of it is Facebook, Instagram ads. Everyone gets them. They do a pretty good job of finding people that might be interested in, um, you know, in Kenny Flowers in this case. So that's really like a main discovery channel from the beginning we've always been about you know word of mouth like i would way rather somebody hear about kenny flowers through um you know an endorsement from a friend or them literally going up to somebody at the bar saying where'd you get that shirt it's awesome so that's really what built our foundation and we got to a point where we decided hey facebook ads can help us reach a lot more people than we're reaching right now and, and really help us like establish a base of customers that can be the first people to know about it um, and build out from there. So I think it's really important um, if you're, you know, if you're just starting, Facebook ads can be intimidating. They can be really expensive if you don't do them the right way. But all, all I can like really offer for someone getting started is make a first step, which to me is setting up just some retargeting. So if somebody's expressed interest in your business or your product before, however they ended up there, that you'll be able to put it in front of them again and remind them because we're, hey, we're all busy, um, even, you know, even on lockdown right now, but everyone's up to everything. They have, you know, shorter attention spans than ever. And sometimes they, they are interested in what you have. They just aren't ready to make a, a purchase at that time. So making sure you're able to do that, that you can collect emails so you can stay in touch with them, let them know when you have good promotions going, new product launches that that they might be able to be like the first to, you know, hop in and, and get. And I think those are really, to me, the cores. There's a thousand different ways you can grow a business. You could go a press angle, you can do Google ads, you could go Pinterest route, Snapchat, TikTok, it goes on and on, but it's really about finding something that works for you until you can build up a solid enough base to, uh, you know, 
to, to have that and establish and have room to experiment more. Totally. When you look back at your assumptions of e-commerce and D2C coming into it, and then you're like five, six years deep, and I'm sure a lot of those assumptions have either been validated or a few, what are, what are some of those things you, you thought coming in that were either going to be challenges or easy and then turned out to be the opposite? In the beginning, I thought I had to create the most unique experience possible for Kenny Flowers. So our original website was literally like you would just flip side to side through shirts as if it was a closet. And as cool as that was for people that were willing to put in the you know time and interest in the beginning, it was against consumer behavior and how they understand shopping. So for us, once we were trying to reach more people, we found it extremely important to know which things you don't have to recreate. Um, there's so many great apps out there that can help you do things like collect reviews. There's you know apps that help you filter a collection so you can find the exact type of product or size that you want. There's some things that are so in place that you should totally take advantage of and use your product and your branding and your language to be the unique differentiators uh, versus trying to teach a customer a different way of shopping per se. Yeah, it's 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 a good point. I feel like when you're trying to be innovative, you try to like think like, how can I reinvent the wheel as much as possible? But in reality, it seems most founders say like, you want to build like the most frictionless process that people are used to as possible and let your product quality and value be the differentiation and that's enough. Exactly. And I mean when you're when you're shopping around on sites, you'll notice that some of your favorite brands, you don't notice that they have an extremely simple process of finding what you want and buying it. Um, I've noticed that a lot on the men's side of things. As we've gone into women's, um, as my fiance showed me some of her like, you know, favorite brands and what their sites are like, it is insane. Like I think guys just have such a um, lower like attention span in general when they're shopping that has to be like perfectly laid out for you. Well, women love the shopping experience and they want to, you know, go through some chaos to to find the goods. When you think about that first couple hundred people, likely friends and family that were trying out the product, I think that process and that iteration cycle is so fascinating. What are some of the points of feedback or like additional little tweaks or things based on your first couple of runs that people gave you that ultimately, you know, iterated the product to where it is today? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I put a lot of, like I said, effort into that initial run. So really I was collecting ideas and feedback from those first customers before I even created a shirt. Um, I was asking my best guy friends, even some of my best girlfriends, what, like, you know, the guy, Hey, what would you want in a Hawaiian shirt? When do you want to be wearing one? Um, you know, what are like, what type of designs do you want? But then the girl size, like, how do you want it to fit? How would you find a guy wearing a shirt attractive? Like, oh, we want, um, you know, the sleeves to be shorter so you can see a little bicep is like, you know, something that was in the, um, the initial feedback. So I really took all of that into effect in the beginning before even creating a product. So then it was more fine tuning once it was out there. One of the main pieces of feedback that I got at first was very much that like, dude, this is an expensive Hawaiian shirt. And at the, you know, we're basically our shirts are 79 to $95, which was actually as fair as possible, given I was creating this for my friends. I wasn't trying to rip off my best buddies on a shirt um, by any means. But then once they, once they got them and they felt them, they were like, okay, these are very soft. These are well created. This is literally what I was talking about in my feedback. It's perfect. Like, don't change a thing. So we, we we've kept a lot of the same details in our shirts, like coconut buttons, a sunglass loop in the front pocket where you can keep your shades in place, um, even kind of like stitched collars to keep them from flopping around too much. Um, a lot of those initial you know pieces to the the masterpiece all, all came into play then. And, and then it's a continuous cycle too with customers. Like for me, I wanted to make sure that I was asking them what they wanted next. Um, right when I launched the shirts, the questions started coming from um, from the girls like, hey, will you be creating Hawaiian shirts for girls? Will you be creating items for girls? And at the time, the shirts were very unisex. Girls would rock them all the time. And now we've just built that out. So they have other interests like the kimonos and cover-ups too. Totally. Yeah. I've got, I mean, you guys sent me a shirt and, and I, I have to say like the quality is just next level, right? Like you can tell the difference between a $20 Amazon Hawaiian shirt that someone buys and a Kenny flower shirt. Like you just feel the difference both like in your hands and like when you wear it. And I think 
that difference, if people don't know, it's just because they haven't tried the high, higher quality, but like that's what they all want. So I, I commend you on the, the product. It's great. Well, thank you. That, that means a lot to hear that from you. Um, in the beginning, right when I got to Bali, I'd say about a month into the trip, I was lucky to cross paths with this infamous Hawaiian shirt designer, this guy Amos. And he taught me one thing that one lesson that I really took to heart and uses kind of like a main pillar of the business, which is teach your customers quality. Um, Because once they expect things one way, they don't want to hear it from anywhere else, essentially. So once you get used to using like the sunglass loop in the front pocket, it's just it's something that becomes nature. Or once you notice, hey, this company is using coconut buttons instead of plastic, then you're going to notice the plastic buttons on your other shirts more. Um, So all of our details are really on creating like a high quality product for our customers, but also just teaching them along the way. Because like you said, sometimes people don't have anything else to compare it to or or aren't sure what to base it off of. Um, So we, I mean, I, I love every day, like I just love knowing that there's customers receiving Kenny flowers for the first time and they're feeling it and they're saying, okay, I'm, glad that Instagram ad found me. <laughs> yeah, totally. That's that's a really interesting point about like teaching your customers quality. Cause I think like a good example in a different space is kind of like Lululemon, right? Like most mm-hmm. guys would never pay $120 for pants. Like it's insane. Like you have maybe have one or two nice pairs, but the ABCs are crazy. And, and all my friends who are not in that category, they're like, oh, I have to have these. And it's, you just see like user behavior changing because someone showed them the pants and it's just completely different. So I, I totally agree with that. A question that I wanted to ask you is about the way you approach this structure for the business. So, you know, I, I think building a lifestyle brand, like a side hustle, you know, side passion lifestyle brand is hard enough, but flipping the switch to go from that to like a full scale operation where you have employees and you're starting to scale, maybe you are on venture scale, that's a significant shift. So how do you think about, and how did you think about making that shift? And what were some of those strategic choices you made? Yeah, I mean, the reality is every year, it's a different business. Um, and of course, we're growing the same thing. It's the same brand behind it. But the way I was thinking in the first year, in the second year, in the sixth year now is totally different. Um, and, and it's uncomfortable growing sometimes. You, you finally feel like you have it figured out at a certain scale and level. And then you have to, well, you don't have to, but you want to push it to the next um, next scale and level. So if I was to just go through the years quickly, I would say the first year, it was very much just, hey, it's me doing everything. I'm figuring this out for myself. And thank you, mom, for shipping the shirts from the house. Um, but besides that, let's just focus on like seeing what Kenny Flowers can be. The second year um, was a little bit more to that tune, but all of a sudden we were at a bigger scale. I felt like I didn't really know how to grow, but I had created a like sustainable lifestyle for myself. Um, where I could, although I wasn't taking a salary, you know, my expenses were essentially covered since I was 24 seven on the business. And it was in that third year, um, when I met my fiance and started to realize, Hey, like I have to do more than just support myself. Like I have to turn up the, you know, the fo not the focus, but just the like a, a little bit more. So that way, all of a sudden I'm like, I'm not just providing for myself, but I'm now like thinking about multiple people. Um, you know, her and then down the road, like, you know, maybe a family, et cetera. So I I would say that was a big adjustment year for me. And in each year, generally, I try to build the business, I would say three times. My goal is like, if I can 3x the business, that'll put me in a a good place where we haven't grown too crazily and maybe missed a thing or two, but also it's pushing us in a really solid direction. Um, And kind of to your point, like the last couple of years, those have been way bigger jumps. And all of a sudden, instead of, you know, living in Bali and kind of working my own schedule, I have to be there for certain employees, um, have more scheduled meetings every week, um, you know, work with an agency here and there. And things have definitely morphed over the, over the years. And, and right now it's, it's at a new, new place where we've just brought on a couple new, um, new hires and, like I said, I'm very, I'm excited for this next wave, but we're saying if we want to have the 2021, we want to have like that starts now. And even though it's like a little bit of the off season, given it's fall winter from the nature of our business, but we, uh, you know, we, we know that we have to start kind of like preparing and getting ready at this point. 
my fiance is literally in the other room trying on 2021 bikini samples. So she's happy. Yeah. A question around in those early days, right? So I feel like people who are really driven and try to start something like this, what I think can be crippling is like putting an earnings target where like, I have to make this amount of money to like pay for my expenses. And and you mentioned year two or so you were able to cover that, but how did you approach that in the very early days? Did you set a target? Like, did that stress you out or were you kind of like, you know, you had enough saved, you're like, let's just let it flow and see what happens. Yeah. So everyone's in, you know, different circumstances when it comes to to starting a business, whether you've raised money, whether you're starting it with $10, it's all different. For me, I knew that I wouldn't do as well under financial pressure while I was trying to figure out what my business was, um, getting it started. So I made it a case. I would tell my friends if they were like, oh, how are things going like financially? I would make it a case to say, hey, I have no financial goals this year. My goal is to create a shirt that you'll have an amazing time in and you'll have such a good time that hopefully you tell some other people about it. And then let's talk next year and see where we see where we are. Um, so it wasn't really until I got to that point and I, I, I did find it helpful to to set financial goals. I've never been a, okay, three years out, it must we must hit every number at this point. But I did find it extremely helpful to kind of go in sprints where it's like, hey, this month, you know, this is our sales goal or just what I'm trying to achieve um, with Kenny Flowers. And let's back into how we get there. But usually, you know, sales aren't as much like direct, like, hey, today I'm going to wake up and have a good sales day. It's usually the work you're putting in months, years, um, you know, ahead of that, that get you to a point where, where you can have financial success. So I've, uh, I, you know, I'm really proud of what I've been able to do with Kenny Flowers, sustainably growing it um, and, you know, kind of covering it. I, I haven't taken a salary to date, um, but I also know in this, you know, next phase that we're going into that that, that is important um, to, to be progressing the business that way and, and setting things up to, to grow to its full potential. Totally. Yeah. And, and I think that leads well into the question I was going to ask. And, and you mentioned you know, your, your like anchor point roughly has been like three X over year over year. And I, I like to ask a question on the show around, you know, what do you think would have to happen for Kenny flowers to 10 X where it is right now? Are there macro factors that have to switch? Is it a matter of discovery? Like walk us through kind of how you think about that strategically. Yeah. I mean, I, I know there's things that we should be doing day in day out. You know, it's nothing fancy, nothing sexy. It's just like, there are operational things and things from the marketing perspective that should be happening every day. And that'll be a good base level to allow for the growth. Um, But I do know also at the same time that there are some big steps that we're going to need to make as a company to be 10 X. You know, for us right now, where we make all of our shirts and cover-ups in Bali with a super boutique factory, you know, that when we started with them, it was six, seven people working there. And now it's 50 people. We've been growing with them, trying to create jobs there. And same in Colombia, where we make our swimwear. Um, you know, we really work with these boutique places, but now we're getting at, you know, to a point where if we want to introduce new products, we have to be finding new awesome factories to work with and kind of getting more system in place for how do we find um, places that are true to our brand, creating a product in the exact, you know, type of place you'd want to travel or experience wearing it, um, while also building the business that way. I I think for us, a big part of it is going to be hiring and bringing on the right people that in some cases have experience and in other cases just have a passion for the brand and a hustler mentality to to get it done and figure it out. Um, I think like, you know, for us, the past couple of years, Facebook and Instagram has been a huge part of that. But I think these next couple of years, we're going to, you know, look way more in, into, you know, new avenues, new ways that we can uh, continue to reach new people creatively and hopefully in, in a cool way for everybody. Yeah, for sure. That's a good transition to, you know, like when you manifest the future for what you want Kenny Flowers to be like in the next five to seven years, what is that? Like paint the picture for everyone. Like, are you going into different product categories? Are you obviously amplifying what you have today? Like talk about that a little bit. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. I think it's, you know, I have two ways of looking at this. One is more like playing checkers and the other is more like playing chess. Um, from a checkers perspective, I think we're going to continue to expand, build out the look for guys and girls going on vacations, just enjoying life in general. 
Um, but we're also going to, yeah, continue into building out, yeah, family. Maybe kids get involved. Maybe there's other products past just clothes that you can enjoy um, in the same way that you, you'd you enjoy wearing a shirt now. Um, from a chess perspective, I mean, I do have some, you know, big dreams with Kenny Flowers and just my own day to day where I, I want to be helping other brands grow to their full potential too, using the lessons I'm learning along the way and, you know, giving that back in a way. I also think that, you know, with Kenny Flowers, you, you know, you think of these ideal vacations, the, you know, private villa in Bali, the apartment in Medellin, um, you know, Hamptons weekend with your friends. Like th- these are the things that come to mind and I want to find ways to really build that out um, past just clothing, but being able to, you know, potentially have places that host those types of experiences um, or the right partnerships to to set people up for them. Yeah, that, that chess piece is interesting. We had um, we had Matt Scanlon from Nottamon and he mentioned that he's probably a couple years ahead of, of you in terms of the, the cycle, but it, it was the same way, right? They built out Nottam and then his goal now is to build like a centralized backend for 10 other brands, like so that all the ops and finance and accounting and everything is like systematized. So it sounds very similar to what, what your vision is, which is cool. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that's an awesome approach for them, that what they do with their product and their business is incredible. And I think they're, yeah, it's a great model to, to build off of. And, and yeah, I think kind of similarly to that, I mean, what, what excites me about that potential is I just, I mean, I feel like now I, I might not have the financial <laughs> resources saved up when we're tripling down on inventory each year, but, you know, I, I am able to kind of see who's doing things the right way, whether it's another e-commerce brand, whether it's they're a year into it, or it's just like a coming soon website. I kind of know when, when people have it figured out or kind of have something that they can bring or separate themselves from the rest with. So I, yeah, so yeah, it's, it's kind of to that effect too. I think that's a a cool type of journey. I'll have to look a little more in or try to connect with them at some point. Yeah, it's definitely exciting. And and to that point, right. I'm curious to get your thoughts on like the, the D to C e-commerce, like landscape of the future, like what, what you think where we're shifting towards. It seemed fairly linear over the past few years, what's happened right. because of COVID, I think a lot of this e-commerce has accelerated. So, you know, what are your thoughts around the next like three to five years for D2C e-commerce? Yeah, it's a wild west right now. Um, <laughs> in 2020, there's some brands that are doing incredibly well and others that haven't been able to to keep up with the changing times. Um, if you asked this question last year, or as I'm sure you probably did with previous founders, it was all about, hey, let's build up an online presence then let's get some, you know, brick and mortar stores, you know, in, in place to start creating those communities. I think there is something to that coming back. But right now, I mean, I, I think direct to consumer is completely the way to go. In the past, it's been way more, hey, you should be 100% direct to consumer. Don't think about anything else. But we've had so much success by being open to a conversation with a boutique shop in Palm Beach that wants to have some of our shirts in their shop, um, you know, the wholesale route. And, you know, we don't have a full business built around that, but you, it, it's just, it, it's hard to quantify as much as an ad too. But I know by having shirts in that store that Jimmy Buffett literally walked into it and bought a couple and wore them on tour a couple years ago. Um, and that was a real like turning point and just highlight for me. It was like my lifestyle role model essentially wearing Kenny flowers on stage thriving in it. Um, and, and that wouldn't have happened without being open to wholesale. So I, you know, for, for, for businesses, I think if something's not working, think of alternatives, but if it's, if it's working or if there's new opportunities that present themselves, like there's no harm in trying it out if you have the resources to support it. Yeah. A question I should have asked when we were talking about marketing is around out of the box things that you've tried, if they worked or even didn't work, it's, it's fun to hear. And like that Jimmy Buffett example, like not really a marketing campaign, but like effectively that's really unique and out of the box. W- what other things have you guys experimented with over the years? Well, first off, I'll say that I did turn that Jimmy Buffett shirt wearing experience into a little marketing opportunity. I, um, I sent an email out, um, you know, to have the whole Kenny flowers list serve. And, um, <laughs> What I said was, we're retiring. Jimmy Buffett wore our shirts. Like, <laughs> see you in paradise. And what I meant 
was way more along the lines of, hey, this is just a joke. Like, we're obviously not retiring. We're just picking up momentum now. But the response that we got, it was the best email we've ever sent in terms of like revenue. There are customers stocking up on 10, 12 shirts at a time because they thought we were literally calling it a day. Um, I was getting like screenshots from friends saying, dude, your your friend's brand, Kenny Flowers, just said they're they're done. And I, of course, sent a follow up email saying, guys, it's all good. Sorry, like bad joke, but it ended up being a good marketing um, campaign. Besides that, I mean, we yeah, we, we definitely try to take chances where we can. And I think that's where you'll realize big gains for your company. And it, nothing's guaranteed. But we um, I don't know if you followed along at all, but Barstool, um, Barstool Sports has, uh, you know, Stool Presidente, when everyone was locked down, unable to leave their apartment, he was doing this. Oh, unboxing. yeah, the, the packages. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, we took a shot in the dark. We sent him. A couple items. Usually I would send, um, you know, an influencer personality, a more subtle option, something that I know they'll definitely wear and like. But in this case, I was like, screw it. Let's just send them the most wild shirts we have and let them run with it if he likes them. And if not, then, you know, say la vie. We tried. And we sent him a leopard print shirt. Our, uh, it's called the Paradise. And with no expectations that he would wear it. If anything, we were just hoping he mentioned it on the unboxing, like what a leopard print shirt. No way. Not for me. Um, but instead he showed up to a pizza review and just wore it for a full day wearing a leopard print shirt. And it kind of broke the internet. And before we knew it, we sold out of that shirt. <laughs> like it was just us getting, but it wasn't just letting that happen. He posted about it. He didn't tag us or anything that would cost a lot of money. Um, but what he did was he got a reaction. He got a lot of people to check out that post and everyone was saying, oh, wow, I didn't realize like leopard print shirts were, were, were for me. I got to get one of these. Where do I get them? And we were just getting involved in the comments. I think we got banned like three or four times by Instagram for commenting too many times. But our sales that like those few days were um, were insane for us at the time in the middle of COVID. So, you know, it's really about finding the opportunities. Like when things seem down it just means there's kind of opportunity elsewhere and you know we we were in a position going into this year where you know everybody was riding a high from the consumer to the business like things were good people were buying businesses were growing and then the bottom fell out and for us that meant not only that demand was dropping but also our customers that were buying our product for their honeymoons for their vacations for their music festivals they were going to, you know, they wanted return right away. So like we had this huge, just kind of fallout in March and we essentially, you know, had to really cut back on our ad spend. People weren't interested in buying. It was more figuring out what the hell is going on in the world. But that, that did give us our chance to really like work through some things and kind of reinvent ourselves to a degree, um, which I think is incredibly important. We realized, hey, if shirts aren't clicking right now, what can we do? Our swim factory was shut down in Colombia. Our Bali factory, we probably would have had to cut down their order a good amount, which wouldn't have been good for them. Um, so we transitioned to face masks. We made like lifestyle face masks with the same prints that I'm wearing on my shirt right now, just as a way to kind of brighten people's day, do something a little bit more uh, unique than the standard mask. This was like late March, early April. So right before the the rush of everyone getting into it. Um, and that, that once again, like from our perspective was sort of creative. It was listening to our customers saying, Hey, you should make masks. But in my mind thinking, Ugh, I don't know if that's like the right tone or if people will just um, kind of say like, that's insensitive. Like, who, who knows? It was a very, it was a very touchy time with social media and, and just in general for brand communication. However, we launched the masks, we got the word out about them. And it was our first time really getting mentioned in like GQ and CBS News and Esquire. We got picked up by all these places and got all this press exposure that we wouldn't have um, had otherwise if we weren't focusing on that right then, or if we were just content with where we were with the Facebook, Instagram strategy. Yeah, it's crazy. You're like, I've been here making these shirts for five years and it takes a Hawaiian <laughs> mask to get me into GQ and all these magazines. Exactly. And now hopefully we have the connections to to keep things going as, as things come back to normal. Exactly. Yeah, I was going to say, 
have you thought about trying to have like strategic partnerships? Like one that just comes off the top of my head is like you guys being the official uh, like shirt provider of like Yacht Week or something where like, you know, the, the brands definitely intersect or like being at a festival. I mean, they don't happen right now, but like a pop up at a festival, Coachella or something like that. Have you thought about partnerships like that? Absolutely. I mean, I, I think that's going to be a big part of our strategy in the next few years when it was just me on the ground trying to make shirts and also trying to like, you know, run a few ads and figure out a new warehouse situation. So my mom didn't break her back. Like, you know, during those days, it was a little less on the offense, if you would. Um, but now I think we're getting to a position where we can hopefully, you know, really, really get involved where our customers are. Um, so sometimes that might be a group trip for Yacht Week. Um, other times it might just be honeymooners going to specific resorts and maybe we can you know set something up with that resort um where if they're wearing kenny flowers they can get a free drink on us yeah that's awesome it's easy for founders to come on here and, and paint like a really rosy picture and, and i think you've been really transparent about you know the ups and downs but tactically for people listening if they're aspiring founders the things that haven't worked are often like more valuable to hear than than all the things that have worked so when you reflect over the past few years what are some of the things that that haven't worked across the entire business that you would share? Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's really important to know where you are as a business and what makes sense for you. So in one case, like if you think about warehousing, like I said, I was lucky that I had a supportive mom that was willing to ship a few packages out a day in the beginning. Um, but then being able to switch to a warehouse at the right time, I think being able to be tuned in and just know what time you need to completely shift or change your business isn't incredibly important. Um, I'd say there's uh, like one like one thing that I I think we kind of missed out on from the beginning was just having like customer reviews on our site. Um, we are just now in the process of getting those on, which is way behind every brand. We just didn't at the time a few years ago when they reached out, I was just shocked at how expensive it was to be able to have that system on your site. Um, so I think, uh, I think that for me, the main, uh, I think like challenge that we've had is keeping up with our best selling inventory during our high seasons, um, which when you're bootstrapping a company is hard to do, but it's a huge bummer when you're sold out of your top five shirts, your best couple swim trunks in June. If I was offering advice, just like really knowing how to double down on your best sellers and allow other products to, you know, take not a backseat, but less important. So it's kind of like a lot of companies figure this out within their operations. But for me, it's like to a degree, it's just like knowing when to really, really, really bet on yourself when a design works. And you know, over half our designs are like pure limited edition. Like when they're sold out, they're sold out. But there's some like hero products that we have that, um, you know, that we've had around for a year, two years, three years, because we know anyone new discovering Kenny Flowers might be interested in it. So I think really like the biggest challenge that we've run into is, is that. Um, I think another challenge less that I've run into, it's more like an alternative world. It's like, are you going into this solo or do you need someone along for the ride? Um, you know, there's lots of companies, successful companies that start out just one person and grow from there. And there's others that start out as two people and or three people and grow from there. And I think it's really just understanding how you work best um, and, and what that arrangement is like. So, you know, there, there's things that I'd say I'm still figuring out as I go. I'm by no means like a perfect success example, like you said, but we're in an awesome position right now where because of like, you know, the hard work put in for years and years, the, the, the world is ours. We can go, you know, we could go raise money if that's the route that we want to go. We could just take out a loan to triple down on inventory, knowing that we'll be back in the springtime, or you can kind of stick to a bootstrapping route. It's, it's really just knowing what you're comfortable with and what financial levels you can perform the best at. Some people love saying, hey, I have zero dollars in the bank account. Like, I'm going to go hustle and figure this out. And other people, if they 
owe assent to anybody, they're stressed out and unable to focus on actually building the business. So yeah, I, I mean, I, I'd kind of put it in that space. Yeah, those those are great things. And I, I think, like you mentioned, coming from a position of power, a position of strength for the business, it sounds like Kenny Flowers is, and, and not every company can say that. Shifting to some of these other questions, one that I love to ask is around hiring. And it sounds like you're, you know, you ha- you worked with a few people early on and you're starting to really ramp up the team. So this will be a great question for you. I think hiring is one of the most important things, if not the most important thing you can do. And I think getting superstars on your team is critical for having the, the ship kind of grow, grow beyond just yourself. So what characteristics do you look for in people that you hire and kind of what have proven to be the consistent qualities across the superstars that you found? Yeah, I- I think that is a great, you know, jumping off point here into the hiring conversation. It is incredibly important to grow your business. And to me, there there are a couple different types of hires. And if you know when you need a certain one, then you'll be in a position to succeed. Um, I think there, for me, the two types of hires, one is the, hey, this is a long-term investment. I know this hire is passionate about the brand. There's so much room for them to grow within the company. And I can't visualize a Kenny Flowers in five, 10 years without them here. And then there's other hires that have a specific skill set, can be an incredible asset to the team, can learn and you know get fueled by the passion that other hires on your team have for Kenny Flowers. And they can do something that you haven't been able to do before. Um, And to me, I, you know, I've had some, you know, learning lessons with hiring. I feel really excited about the new people we've brought on. They come with like a lot of experience in the places that we need, whether it's like sales forecasting, inventory planning, or even just like bringing PR more in-house and making sure that it is intertwined with our other marketing channels. Um, so I, you know, I, it's really knowing what you're going for. I did have a, um, scenario two years ago where my first hire ever don't regret it at all, but the week of black Friday, she gave her two weeks notice. And the reason was because she didn't like working remote as much, which was something that unfortunately I can't change overnight and have a 10 person office. And as much as she thought she would. And to me, it was it was a, it was a bummer because I it was someone that at the time I thought of hiring and every employee is going to be a lifelong Kenny Flowers fan and part of the company every day. And I, it's just as important, I think, to realize that some people might not be that way. I remember when I was interviewing at IBM, everyone was talking to me like, oh, you're going to be a great lifelong IBMer. And they're in this old mindset and the reality is like, I'm doing this for a couple of years and then I'm going to see what's next for me. And I think a lot of people think that way. So it's just knowing like how people stand there. And, you know, I don't regret hiring that person at all. She helped bring an operation side to the business that was non-existent at the time. But I think now my biggest lesson I can offer is just understand and figure out the candidates beforehand. And y- you can tell passion for your brand right away. You can tell skill set through a conversation usually, especially through a written test. Um, And you can tell if it's a click if after every phone call or every interview that you have with them, you're like, wow, that flew by. I totally understood what they were saying, how they were talking about it. And it's a click. It fits. So I mean, it's it doesn't happen with everybody. I've been shocked at what I thought would be a perfect candidate on paper. And then you get on the phone and you're like, who, who who's on this? the other line here? Like, I thought you were going to, you know, be the voice of our company and I don't hear any voice right now. Um, so it, yeah, it really comes down to knowing what you're hiring for and understanding how, how that works. And I think it's a balance of the two to, to build the right way. But if you can find rock stars that can take over parts of the business and take care of the areas that you weren't as comfortable in, um, or just more of a weakness, then that's, that's going to just catapult you forward. Totally. Another question that in that space is around like building culture and I, I, especially remote, I've worked in a remote capacity for the last few years and, and have had to build a team and it's really difficult to obviously build culture remote. What are some of the things that you've tried to do 
over time to, to kind of enforce that culture and, and build it the right way? For sure. I mean, when it was just a, a couple of us, it was very easy to just be on the phone or not. But now with a few people involved, we really make a case to have a few more meetings through Zoom, um, you know, see the people behind the screens. Um, but also it's, 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 yeah, it's about making sure people are in the know on what's going on with the company. It's so easy for things to happen and not to share it with everybody. So we do have monthly meetings. Um, we kind of figure out, talk about what the three most important things are for the next month for each person. Um, just so everyone's aware of kind of where the company is going, even if they're not involved on a specific project. And then we celebrate when those things happen afterwards. And um, sometimes, you know, it's unfortunately right now more Zoom happy hour, but we have a couple people in New York um, and they, you know, they just got together for a KF sponsored happy hour after going by a, a clothing drive that we've been supporting in Brooklyn. And I think it's just, yeah, it's, it's sure we can't have a company retreat. Sure, it's not seeing everybody in the office every day, but I think it's making sure like everyone you know, is able to celebrate what they are accomplishing every day, every week, every month, every year. Um, but also kind of in this more remote world, especially if people are really in different parts and not as easy to bring together, finding ways to like re reward them and just let them know that what they're doing matters, what they're doing is making a difference. And it might be like, hey, an employee in New York, what what does your ideal weekend getaway look like like let's instead of a team work retreat how can we send everyone on their own little retreats down to florida you know in cabo whatever the case is to make sure that everyone's yeah getting getting the chance to um in, enjoy the best parts about working with a small company versus just the you know plenty of hours and, and yeah, hard just work the grind. that goes into it the grind that's a good way to put it totally um, a, a few questions for you around wellness. So I, this is a topic like I'm personally super passionate about. It, it would love to get your take on some of these. So the first one is just, you know, how do you think about wellness in general and like, how does it play a part in your, in your daily life? And then we'll get into some of the kind of nuanced categories within it. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, for me, it's, it really comes down to having a bit of a routine, even though we're some, I'm sometimes in Bali, sometimes in Colombia sometimes Instagram husbanding for my luxury travel blogger, <laughs> fiance, um, wherever we are in the world or what's going on, we try to have some consistency, be it like morning walks on the beach, you know, making sure we're having a carrot juice or a celery juice every day, just a couple like health consistencies that, you know, put you in the right mental state to be like, all right, I'm taking care of myself. I, I think that makes a big difference. So we really make it a case wherever we are, like let's get grounded, put our feet in the sand um, or backyard or wherever you are and just connect. I, I think the better you are um, to yourself, the better you're going to be in business, uh, the better that, you know, you're going to be at brainstorming, thinking outside of the box. Like the best ideas aren't going to come when you're sitting at a computer with notes in front of you trying to figure out your next best idea. It's, it's so more true. about talking about it. It's more about looking at things differently. Um, so that, that, that's really what, you know, comes to mind for me is, you know, I, you know, I'm not like the healthiest eater, but I know to get my fruits and veggies every day. I know when I can make a better decision versus not. And, and same with working out. I'm, you know, I'm not in the gym every day, but I'm making sure I, uh, you know, get those eight to eight K steps or more. And, you know, hopefully a few little mini workouts here and there to keep the blood flowing. For sure. Yeah. It could be worse. Morning walks on the beach, feed in the sand. <laughs> Gotta know what you need. Yeah, exactly. So, and, and you mentioned a little bit of this already across a few of these categories, but what I like to do is kind of break down like the wellness stack for the founder that comes on the show. And, and I think of these things like the fitness, nutrition, sleep as compounding. And I think when you, when you do them all in succession to whatever extent works for your body, it does have a compounding effect. And, I, and I've, for personal experience, have skewed on both sides of that and see like the dramatic difference. So I'd love to, I'd love to just walk through a couple of these and, and, you know, as you've been doing, just layer on like your thoughts around each one. If you have kind of set things that you like to go to, if you have any products, either digital or physical that you use, I, I think people really enjoy this section. So we'd love to get your take on some of these. Yeah. I mean, I, in terms of, um, in terms of mini workouts that you can just do from home or 
a hotel room or wherever you are, I use an app called Shred. Um, it's just little 10 to fit, you know, you can do different lengths, but they have mini workouts, which for me, I think are great. It's just 10 minutes of upper body or 10 minutes, full body, lower body abs. Um, and you just try to do, you know, a few a week there and it kind of, it keeps good track of that. Meditation is on my mind. I don't do it religiously um, and haven't, you know, I don't have full buy into a specific app or anything, but I definitely do like that idea of just kind of separating, clearing the mind completely from the thousand thoughts going around at all time. Definitely. Meditation is something that I like I've started and stopped a bunch of times. I just couldn't get myself to like string more than like a week or so together. Um, but it's, you know, you feel the benefit. Yeah. Let me, let me actually add something on that note. It's less an app. It's more the opposite of an app. Like I love putting my phone on airplane mode. Um, not all the time, of course, but trying to find like a couple hours a day or, you know, usually at night, um, is, you know, Hey, it's dinner time. Like, let me put my phone on airplane mode. I don't need to check anything for this hour. Um, and especially on vacation, um, even though sometimes like while traveling or on vacation, I'm still working, there's definitely, there has to be like a day or two carved out where I'm just like, it's a no phone day. That's a great kind of tactic. I feel like a lot of people could benefit from throwing that on airplane <laughs> mode for a few hours. Um, an another one, or I guess the, the last one around this out, cause you, you mentioned, uh, you know, nutrition fitness a bit is the content diet. So how do you think about, you know, and what do you consume around like on the micro content side, like newsletters and podcasts? And then, you know, what are some books, if, if any, that have had a, a positive impact on you? Yeah. I mean, I, I definitely think of now that you mentioned content, like my, my take on work-life balance, which is actually like work-life fluff balance, if you will, with the fluff being like just the distracting, you know, news, Instagram, story, binge watching, you know, those types of activities and basically finding ways to keep that down to a minimum and upping more of like the life, like what, what makes you feel good? What's like a good escape from work? What makes you feel like you're living? And sometimes I, like I, I like to read books. I'm reading the longest book of all time right now, Shantram, if you've ever heard of it. Okay. No, I haven't. Um, it's like a 900 page book, but it's uh it's incredible. It's about a, you know, a guy that escaped jail, moved to India and just got involved in the weeds of uh, Bombay um, from everything from helping out in the slums to getting involved with mafias and questioning life. And yeah, it's just, it's a completely different world and scenario than, you know, I'm living in right now. So to me, I think finding finding just like a book that you can disconnect with is incredibly important. And also, I mean, I'm not a, afraid to admit it. Like I watch Netflix types of shows like with dinner afterwards for, you know, usually just an hour or two a night. But I do think it really helps like separate my mind from, um, you know, from fully work mode. There's always more to be done. The to-do list never ends type of mentality to, okay, it was a very productive day. Things moved in the right direction. And now it's time to relax, sleep well. So tomorrow can be productive. That's a really good point that I feel like goes understated a lot is the, especially when you're working for yourself, the to -do, you can always throw more on the to-do list. Like you, you, you have like one or two items, you cross it off and then you start looking like, what are the next, you really do need, especially in these COVID times to be able to separate like the go from the, from the chill. Cause that helps your, your next go the next day, uh, improve. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, I, I love trying to stay up on not like the news for hours a day, but I definitely go more, like you said, towards like email newsletters, like the hustle, um, you know, even skim my, my friend has actually started one called tag the flag that takes a stab at <laughs> giving the news with no, uh, you know, no sway one way or another. Um, so yeah, I, I try to get my news from a few different places. I'll check like Bloomberg for just articles on everything from stock markets to businesses. And then I, I love listening to podcasts. I'll seriously, I'll throw yours on sometime. Um, if I'm just going on a jog or something like that to hear what's going on with uh, founders and, and kind of other people going through similar types of realities. Awesome. Yeah. I appreciate the, appreciate the rep in the show. Absolutely.
founders and entrepreneurs are some of the best people to ask about other industries outside of what they're focused on, just because you're exposed to so many different business models and read all the time. So if, if you were to put either your consumer hat on or potentially like an angel investor hat, what are some other trends or areas that excite you for the next three to five years? Yeah, that's, a, I mean, that that's a great question. I think that, so there, there's two, two places I could take this. One is just sustainability and what you're doing, whether it's a business operation or a specific type of fabric you use. Um, I think that's a huge trend. It's obviously been around for years and brands are adjusting at different paces. We're even, you know, we're always sourcing new sustainable fabrics to, to test, to start using in our products. And I think that's just such a trend because the reality is it's not every sustainable fabric is is good. Not like just because a brand says, "Hey, this is recycled polyester," it doesn't mean that the you know that the print on the fabric is gonna last as well. It doesn't mean like you know. So there are a lot of things to kind of weave through there, and I think the brands that have it figured out or are making it a priority to figure it out are the ones that you should be paying attention to. Um, I think that's incredibly important. And then the other big shift that I'm seeing. Um, very much based off of this year is customers want to hear about the good a business is doing. They want to hear about their charitable donations. They want to hear, um, you know, what they're doing to make the world a better place. And this isn't anything new, but I think it was accelerated a few years um, in terms of when it would kind of come to the f- forefront. When I started Kenny Flowers, my biggest goal was to create a genuine business. I didn't like how there were businesses out there leading with, hey, if you buy X, we donate X. I just felt like those were businesses selling a donation versus fully selling a product that they're 100% behind and they know it's the best out there. Um, so in the beginning, for me, like I did, as inspired as I am by a lot of the companies that do that right, I didn't want Kenny Flowers to go that way. I wanted people to buy the shirt because they loved the shirt and over time build up the trust with customers that were doing things the right way behind the scenes. Like way before Kenny Flowers started, I've been working with um, a school in Bali where we actually like I've been raising money through a nonprofit and sending 10 kids a year to college there that wouldn't be able to go otherwise. And I've never felt the need to bring that up or make it like a highlight feature of the company. But this year, we've had customers reaching out. They've said, hey, what are, what are you guys doing? Why should I buy from you and not the other guys? And as much as I don't like it being used as a marketing force, I think it's, from a customer perspective, really important to make sure that customers, especially during these times, can feel as good as possible and have something to look forward to. And We've relied more on it being a specific print, but in the future, I think it's really about having um, just like a full on feeling and confidence in wearing a company, knowing that by buying from them, you are making a difference around the world in every way. And, and, And I think there's some, once again, companies that are doing that extremely well, some kind of built off of that as a marketing angle. Um, so I really want consumers in general and, you know, something I live by too, to like, not to give them like a negative look, but just be aware that like there there's people doing it really well. And there's some that are just kind of marketing tactics, you know? Yeah. I, I really like your approach towards that though. I think people forget like you can do the right thing and tell no one and like, it's still a net benefit for the world. Yeah. So, so, I mean, I, I think that's, it's the big, the big lesson I think from this year is like, don't necessarily judge a book by its cover kind of cliche. Um, but yeah, there's, there's companies out there that are doing so much good, but might be a really bad operation behind the scenes or might be like highlighting the good, but making things in a sweatshop, you know, and then there's others that might not be saying as much. Um, I'm not even saying that, but just like are focusing solely on, Hey, how can I create 10 jobs? in my hometown that I'm based in. Um, you know, like there, there's just like, there's different ways that people are approaching. And I think in general, every, I think every human has a good that they're trying to, um, get towards or push. It can just get misinterpreted by sometimes. So really just understanding, um, companies, people behind them is I think exciting and cool to learn about and something that's been more transparent than ever. Definitely. Totally agree. 
All right, final two questions for you. So the first one is the startup manifesto. So if you had to write a startup manifesto with five of the most important key lessons or pitfalls to avoid when starting out, what would they be? Yeah, I mean, for me, the lesson is that I I knew Kenny Flowers was my calling. I was passionate about it and I was willing to put in the work to make the dream work. Um, so in terms of like an actual lesson, I'd say it's just make sure you're passionate enough to 100% commit to what you're doing for 10 or more years before you start it. Because a lot of people think, hey, I have this great idea. Within a year, it's gonna be off the charts and I can sell it in two years. And it's just not the right mentality, I don't think. Um, I think it's way better to know, hey, I'm gonna, like, I will make this my life, basically. That's how much I care about it. And then see where things can go. So that's my first piece. The second is, yeah, it's something I already hit on. Like, don't wait for the perfect business plan to be ready. It's more important that you're just getting your hands in the weeds and figuring it out. Um, that'll help define the business model and in ways that'll help you create a better business because you don't have any upfront restrictions or guidelines that you're sticking to while you're trying to figure it out. Um, let's see, the third, for me, the first couple of years, like I said, I was so focused on creating an amazing product and building a brand. And I think that's like exactly what you should be focusing on those first couple of years. There's always kind of like fine tuning that you can do from like a business perspective. Um, You know, there's always like cost cutting or as you scale, maybe I can bring the cost of shipping down a dollar. Great. Shouldn't be your concern the first two years, just create an excellent experience um, from the product to the brand. Make sure your customers are happy and then figure out where you can fine tune the business without sacrificing any quality. Um, Another thing like for me that was really, really helpful as I was growing and needing to offload some of the stuff that I was used to being in every day is just make a list of what you love doing, like the tasks involved in running your business, and then also make a list of what you don't like and kind of what you can't stand doing. And that's what you should be hiring to fill. Um, You know, if you don't like customer support emails, find someone that loves responding to customers all day. If you, uh, if you don't like designing shirts, I, I love it, but (laughs) I'm just saying, if you don't like designing, then find an awesome designer that, you know, that you align with and can take a lot of that off of your back. So that's, that would be four. And then five, this is something I didn't, haven't done as, you know, great of a job as I'd like to have, but I would say document whatever you can from the process. Like, even if it's like extra work for you, it's just, to me, it's, it's interesting hearing like how people went about starting their businesses, seeing the pictures, the videos of, oh, this is me in the factory, like literally figuring out which three shirts I'm going to put in this collection. Um, that type of stuff. I mean, I think it's interesting to people and it it might be what makes the difference and separates you from the competition and the rest of the market um, in your customer's eyes. So yeah, I would say number five is document what you can. Yeah, that's a great list. And that that last point is so true. I, feel, I, I wish like some of these founders that we all like look up to had documented their process the whole way. Like just that dialogue would be so interesting. Yeah. I mean, I'll, I'll just quickly add off of that. Like it is extra work to document things. It, it's it's a different mentality. So what I would say is like, there there's some people that'll tell you, put your head down, don't worry about documenting, get it done. And in 10 years, you can tell the stories. And then the other approach is document along the way, get others involved. And I'm starting to lean more, especially in this day and age that people want the transparency. They love seeing behind the scenes. Like when I, when I take, um, you know, when I go to the factory, when I'm in Bali, I'll like introduce them to the people that make the shirts. I'll like show the actual cutting, take them through the process. And it's, it's really interesting to people that have never seen it. And if I, if I have a friend visiting Bali, I'll take them to the factory and show them the same thing. It's just, it's cool and exciting. And I I wish there was more of that out there in other businesses. So I could, you know, see, learn, get intrigued by stuff as well. Yeah. That's awesome. And then the the second question that we ask everyone is a nomination. So this has been a phenomenal way for the show to grow. It's your turn to nominate another founder that's either a friend, colleague, or mentor of yours that you'd like to see on the show in the future. Absolutely. Um, I would go with my 
friend slash colleague, this guy named um, Mapati Diop. He runs a company called Diop and they make incredibly cool African diaspora inspired um, shirts, headbands, et cetera. They were in business a couple of years growing um, really kind of slowly, to be honest. But then this year they blew up and they made incredible face masks that really like brought to life everything they were. Um, they made, you know, the masks charitable and have donated over a hundred thousand dollars to organizations across Detroit. It, it's just, everything they do is just so pure and awesome. It's, I think just two guys there right now, um, the co-founders, but it, it's, uh, yeah, it's just, uh, you know, a company that I really respect and admire, especially this year, seeing how they've just gone off and held on to the rocket ship. So if you can if you can grab him for an hour, I think he'd be a really fun one to talk to. Yeah, that's great. I'm really looking forward to getting him on. That's awesome. I, I love stories like that where, you know, there's some catalyst that just explodes the business. Yeah, they, they went through some incubator too in the beginning. I forget which one. Um, so yeah, it was like, and they were, I was on like a list where they were like updating every month or every quarter, like, hey, this is what's going on. This is what didn't work. So kind of to that point of like documenting it all, I think, I think there'll be some great, learnings from the beginning that they'd like to share. Cool. Before I let you go, I, d- I just want to acknowledge you for a second. I think, you know, in, in listening to the conversation, I'm obviously hosting, but I, I'm a huge fan and, and and learning along the way. And I think there's a few things from our conversation that really inspired me about you. And, and the biggest one is that I feel like you're just, you're so down to earth and really live the brand. Like not a lot of founders, you can talk to them for an hour and, and really feel like both the connection, the vibe, the core values, everything that the brand stands for, you embody that. And I think that is really unique and and incredibly important when you're trying to scale, especially lifestyle brands. So I just want to thank you again for coming on. And I'm going to continue to be a huge fan and supporter of yours in the business and, and really appreciate talking to you. I appreciate that, Callaway. It's been a pleasure being on the show. You make it so easy to just chat shop, which I love doing. And yeah, next time I'm in New York, we'll have to link up for for a drink or something. Yeah, absolutely. That sounds great. Kenny Hayesfield, founder of Kenny Flowers. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Absolutely. Have a good one. Thank you for listening to that episode with Kenny Hayesfield of Kenny Flowers. If you're loving the show and want to support, there's a couple quick things you could do that would really help us out. One, we know you're busy and might not always have time to listen to the full episode each week, and that's okay. In addition to releasing the episode, each Tuesday, we'll send out a five-minute email recap with a summary of the weekly conversation. We also plan to use that email list for fun giveaways in the future, so be sure to sign up. Go to thefounder.substack.com to sign up. The link's also in our bio. Two, go to Apple Podcasts and do three quick things for us that take less than 30 seconds. Press the subscribe button, leave us a five-star rating, and then write a couple sentence positive review on why the show inspired you. These ratings and reviews are super important, and they signal to Apple that they should put our show in front of other people that might like it. Three, follow us on Twitter and Instagram at Founder Podcast. Each week we put out teasers, audio clips, and important quotes from the episode. And lastly, check out our website as a mission control for the show. Go to thefounderpod.com. We have a page on there called Special Offers where we link up all the discount codes from our founders' companies, as well as the books and resources they recommend. I hope you enjoyed that episode and are looking forward to the next one. Until then, I'm Callaway, and this is the founder. founder.